Thank you, Don, for that offering of music. Let's turn together to the last letter in your Bibles, the last letter in the New Testament. We'll be uh, reading from chapter 1 of this revelation, this circular letter from the Apostle John. Uh, John gives us a gospel. We have letters from John, and here is a circular letter where it, uh, it comes in the form of a prophecy. Um, so we might say this is from the Apostle John, but we could also say it's from the prophet John. Um, that we have here in the New Testament in a very familiar apocalyptic form, full of uh, images, symbols, uh, speaking about the end times which the church continues to live in um, to the the present day, the time between the resurrection and ascension of the Lord Jesus uh, and His return. Uh, So this revelation is about Jesus. It's about Jesus and it is from Jesus. He is both the subject and the agent of what is revealed to John um, and through the appointed angel. A uh, great blessing here, great blessing in hearing this word read, great blessing in, in receiving this word, um, it's receiving and, and obeying what the Lord has, has given to us. So even as a church can take uh, great comfort, great assurance uh, through this word in times of um, testing and trial. <clears throat> and so John's going to open this letter with, with an expected greeting, not how we're used to a letter opening. If I'm writing a letter, I might write, Dear Hannah, Dear Tim, Dear Alex, but not, not familiar um, in that time. When they were opening letters, it was just first name, the one writing, and the recipient. Brad to Katie, Brad to Howard, Brad to Tim. Um, that's how, how their letters would open. So here it is, John to the seven churches. Uh, he greets them with uh, this grace and peace from the triune God. So we'll be reading verse 4 through 8. John to the seven churches that are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come and from the seven spirits who are before his throne and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead and the ruler of kings on earth, to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and made us a kingdom, priest to his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all tribes of the earth will wail on account of him. Even so, Amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. This is God's holy and enduring word. Let's pray together. Lord God, we ask that you would show us great and wonderful things from your word. This is a word forever fixed in the heavens, a word that is a lamp to our feet. It is through this word that you teach us and encourage us. It is through this word that you assure us of your sovereign plan and purpose, of your sovereign grace. Assure us of your love for us in Christ. Lord, we ask your blessing upon this time in your word. Uh, uh, may, May it be preached faithfully Lord, make us receptive to this word. Holy Spirit, help us. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. Well, when was the last time that you offered a benediction for someone, that you offered a word of blessing? Now, maybe you didn't have your hands raised with a word of blessing, which we'll do in a few minutes, but have you offered any benedictions? Has anyone sneezed in your home this morning or maybe on the way to church? That's when we offer a benediction, right? Bless you. That's sort of the natural response, sort of a cordial response these days. I was was looking up the history of that. Like, where did that come from? Why do we offer this benediction after someone sneezes? And there's no real, you know, point where you can say it really started at at this point in this place. But some will trace it back to the 14th century and the, the spread of the Black Plague. Black, or the Bubonic Plague. Black Death, it was called. And when someone would sneeze... 
that was a bad sign. They either were infected or might be infected. And so a bless you, it was a form of farewell. There, there's no more we can do. We, we commend your soul to God. Bless you. Maybe it started there. Um, some believe that sneezing actually uh, expelled evil spirits from the body. And so a bless you was, well, great. I'm, I'm glad that evil spirit's gone. Let's, let's sort of ward off the return of the spirit to the body. And so we'll give you this, this blessing. Um, others actually thought you expelled the soul when you sneezed. Um, well, bless you. Let, let's get that soul. Make sure the evil one doesn't snatch that soul away from you. And so we'll offer this word of, of blessing, this benediction. Um, don't really know where it all, all started. Um, but what we've read this morning in Revelation 1, it starts with a benediction. It starts with a blessing from God through his, through his messenger to his people, to the church. Uh, God gives the benediction, doesn't wait till, till the end. He gives the benediction right up front. Uh, and that, that blessing, it transitions to praise and honor and glory to the Lord Jesus. So this moves from, from benediction to doxology. The first thing you know, we're going to consider is the source of God's grace and peace that comes from this benediction and then the security that we have, the security of God's people as evident by the doxology. Source of God's grace and peace gives way to the security of God's people. You know, I could think of no, no better summary, no shorter, succinct summary of the gospel than what we opened with here. Grace to you in peace. The grace of God abounds to you. God looks with favor upon you. You have, have His peace now and forever. You can rest in Him. Oh, there's, there's so much crammed into those few words. Grace to you and peace. The Lord Jesus is our peace. He has made peace through the blood of His cross. All that gospel right there. In that blessing, grace to you and peace. So that the source of this gospel, this benediction, it's the triune God. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Each member of the Godhead is mentioned here, uh, starting with God the Father. From Him who is and who was and who is to come. And we, will, we read a similar designation in verse 8. Helps us, helps us bookend this greeting. The self-existent God, the eternal God. Clear allusion here to Exodus chapter 3. If you remember what was happening in that portion of Scripture. The Lord has told Moses, go to the people. Go to the people and, and tell them that, that, that I've sent you. And then Moses, who wasn't really keen on the idea, said, well, Lord, who, who should I tell them sent me? What should I say? He said, I am who I am. I am who I will be. I am has sent you. This, this is the God who is. He is absolute in his being. He is absolute in his sovereignty. So here's an expression of God's eternal existence, but, but John changes it just slightly. You know, instead of the God who, who is presently existing, who, who, who was and who will be in future existence, he says, and who is to come. So he's not, not talking about a future existence, but an expectation. God is coming. Uh, he, he's going to be present in the future, but, but, but everything future for this young church, everything future for, for you and me, for everyone else in this world, hinges on the one who is, who was, and who is to come. Because he's coming with salvation. He's coming with judgment. We hear from the prophet Isaiah, Behold, the Lord comes with might, and His arm rules for Him. Behold, His reward is with Him, and His recompense before Him. This is what is to come, the one who is to come. It speaks of God the Father. Uh, and it's actually the Father who is speaking in verse 8. It's, it's, it's only one of two places where the Lord speaks directly the prophet, I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, the one who is, who is to come, the Almighty. You know, we don't see Greek letters very often or deal with uh, the Greek 
alphabet, unless we're really digging in the original languages here in the New Testament. Uh, when I see Greek letters most often and during the week, or, or if you're out and about, will be on the little license plate holders, right? The uh, little fraternity groups or the sorority groups. Um, I don't know, what, what are some of them? The Alpha Chi Omega or uh, Phi Beta Kappa or something like that. Um, identifying these Greek, local Greek chapters or Greek life chapters, I think they're called. Maybe some of you are part of one of those. Now, they usually require, you know, there's certain entrance requirements into these these Greek chapters, there's a, there's a type of identity that goes along with this, a camaraderie, usually a lot of networking that happens, a lot of pride in these um, chapters. The Lord God has his own Greek chapter. Uh, only the Almighty, the Lord of hosts, is Alpha and Omega. First and last, beginning and end. These are all, all parallel uh, phrases it really comes from prophet Isaiah Isaiah 44 thus says the Lord the king of Israel and his redeemer the Lord of hosts I am the first and I am the last besides me there is no God in literary terms we call this a merism where there is two opposites two extremes and both extremes are named to include everything that's in between beginning and the end. Uh, this is the sovereign Lord of history. He is the, the source of all history. He's the goal of all history. Our God has the, the first word in creation. He has the very last word in the new creation. He's Alpha and Omega. So this blessing has its source in the Father. And then it says, from the seven spirits who are before his throne. So here's the quieter person of the Trinity the more forgotten person uh, of the Godhead. And we're familiar by now with the number seven, that number of completion, of fullness. We're going to see that over and over again in this revelation. Seven churches in Asia Minor. This, this was a message for all the churches. The church in its fullness, past, present, and future. And so seven spirits, a designation here for, for the one effectual Holy Spirit of God. And we will see the the diversity of the Spirit's work and message to these churches. And Zechariah chapter 4 speaks of seven lamps as God's one Spirit. What do you see? I said, I see and behold a lampstand all of gold with a bowl on top of it and seven lamps on it with seven lips on each of the lamps that are on the top of it. This is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, not by might nor by power, but by my Spirit says the Lord of hosts. It's another indication that what John is receiving from the Lord has, you know, it's going to have similarities with the revelation given to uh, the prophet Zechariah. And next week, we're going to read about seven lampstands identifying the one Holy Spirit uh, of God among his church. And so this benediction, grace and peace to you, comes from the Father, from the Spirit, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness. It's the Lord Jesus who, who testifies and speaks the truth of God. He is the prophet of God. There's no false word that was ever found in the mouth of the Lord Jesus. And he is a witness to the very end. What we read there as, as the word witness uh, in this Greek language is martyros. That's where we get our word martyr. It's Jesus who was, was marred. He, he, he had a witness to the very end, a witness that cost him his life. So Stephen, Acts chapter 7, 8, not the first martyr of the church. Jesus, the true and faithful witness, martyr. He's the firstborn of the dead, the rightful heir of creation. Jesus will inherit the kingdom of God from the Father, rule in that kingdom. So all leaders everywhere, at all times, are subordinate to Christ as the one who rules for the kings of the earth. So it's the Father, the Spirit, and the Son uh, that give this benediction. It should be a, a tremendous encouragement for believers, especially in times of suffering, especially in times of persecution, uh, to hear this threefold title of Jesus 
that, that would assure them, it would assure us that Christ has gone before us. That he is our faithful witness. He's opened the way through death to life. He's victorious. He rules even now. So really, God, God's stressing his sovereignty for the encouragement of those who will suffer for their faith. So is it helpful? Ask yourself that question. Is it helpful to know that God is the source and goal of all history? He, he, is, he, he is the Lord of hosts, the Lord who, whose power is unmatched and unrivaled by anyone or anything in this world. And this is not just some... Sometimes we think of God's power. Yes, he, He's omnipotent. He's all-powerful. And you know He's the one that can just yield the biggest club, right? And do whatever it is He wants to do. But this power is... It's focused. It's controlled. It's controlling all things throughout the course of history. That's the kind of power he wields, which means he's guiding you, your, your story, your, your life. His power's at work in you today, molding you, maturing you for his glory. When I was a junior, senior in high school, I used to lead us a small group study, met in the library of the school at 7 o'clock on Friday mornings. That was an act of service to be there by 7 on Friday mornings for me in particular. Uh, but the, the group, there were several small groups that met, and we'd, we'd meet as a large group first uh, for some time of singing and, and prayer. And we'd have these little booklets, and invariably, every Friday, we would sing this one song. Uh, you are my strength when I am weak. You are the treasure that I seek. You are my all in all. Seeking you as a precious jewel, Lord, to give up, I'd be a fool. You are my all in all. Um, that was our prayer, what we desired, um, that the Lord would be, would be Alpha Omega, that he would, that would be our all in all. Um, our God is and will be revealed as all in all. Is, is he that to you? Is he your all in all? Do we worship him as all in all with each day that he's given us? Because Christ has gone before us, because he goes with us right now, we, we can turn over our fears, we can turn over our trials with every day that he's given us. He knows your need and he loves you. Loves you. So there's a shift of emphasis here in verse 5. A shift from the blessing of God to the praise of his people. Benediction to doxology. Security. That the church is secure in Christ. And it's a security that the church needs to hear. Um, it, it produces this singing. A doxology of praise to the Lord Jesus. You know, so sometimes we will close our our services with a doxology. Now unto him who is able. We'll sing those words. Well, here, here's more of that unto him language. To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood. Jesus is the priest. He's the, he's the sacrifice, the Passover lamb, the very fulfillment of Israel's hope and redemption. Could there be any greater love than this? And for the Son of God to lay down his life for us. I mean, genuine love, we know this, we've experienced, genuine love is selfless. It's costly, it's sacrificial. Giving of oneself for another. Jesus has given himself for us because he loves us. We will never know or experience a greater love than this. Pay the full wages for our sin is... is his love has restored us to God. So now we are a kingdom priest to our God and Father. We find a very similar phrase in Exodus 19. If you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all peoples. For all the earth is mine and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. You remember the apostle uh, Peter uses similar language. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy 
nation. I think of, of God's people in the Old Testament, how they were, they were intended to mediate the worship of the one true God, sprinkled with the blood so that they could be about this mediation. Okay, now, now we as a church mediate this worship. By the shed blood of Christ, all of God's people, we have that, that access as, as the priest. We have unmediated access before the throne of grace. We can go right to the Holy of Holies in the name of Jesus. We, we don't need another earthly priest or mediator. We go in the name of Christ. I mean, what, what a confidence, what a security for God's people. Not a confidence in ourselves, not a security of our own making. It is Christ's love that secures us. Christ who has, has freed us, He's made us. Here, here's the purpose. He's freed us for a purpose. To worship, to lead the nations in worship. To Him be glory and dominion forever and ever. That, that is our eternal doxology. And we can sing securely because our King is coming again. There are verse 7. Behold, He's coming with the clouds. Every eye will see Him, even those who pierce Him. And all tribes of the earth will mourn on account of Him. Um, now, I enjoy watching the sky. I guess I'd be called a cloud watcher. Maybe some of you are cloud watchers. Um, I love seeing how the, you know, the, the, the clouds take shape and the different types of clouds. You know, I could tell you the difference between the nimbostratus and the altostratus and the cumulus and the cirrus and what altitudes they're found and so on. I just love watching that. Um, but when the Lord Jesus returns, it will not be the clouds that have my attention or yours. Now notice that Jesus is not coming on the clouds or, or in the clouds. The clouds aren't transporting Jesus back to this earth. He is coming with the clouds. They are accompanying the Lord on His return. That cloud imagery should be familiar to us. It was a cloud that enveloped Mount Sinai. It was a cloud that filled the tabernacle and the temple, the very presence of God with His people. Here Jesus comes with the clouds, present uh, manifest glory with his people. Um, you know, I can't help but think that maybe that contributes to our uh, fascination with clouds, especially the, the grandeur and the power and the majesty of a great cumulonimbus cloud. Um, you know, we get just a glimpse of God's power in the atmosphere around us, but it, it's a reminder of his presence. Even as we hear the rumbles, maybe as we're sitting here today. Every eye will see him. Every person. So is this every person in the world? Yeah, I believe it is. How is Jesus going to show himself to every person in the world at the same time? I have absolutely no idea. But this is the creator God who spoke the cosmos into existence. I don't think it's going to be that hard for him. Christ will appear. Paul tells us every knee will bow before the Lord Jesus. Um, Every eye will see him. People, he, his people will rejoice at his coming, but there will be guilt piercing the hearts of those who have willfully rejected him. Now, now some uh, think that this really is a cry of repentance, that those whom, whom the Lord has called to himself for eternal salvation, that they will finally turn in repentance. And I think that could very well be true. But even more so, a cry of remorse. Pe people will... People will weep and mourn at the realization of what they have lost for eternity. You know, John, John was, was with Jesus, close friend of Jesus. He spent much time with him. He heard Jesus uh, speaking. And, and Jesus actually combines the imagery that we've read here. He took some images from Daniel 7 and from Zechariah 12. This is, this is what John heard from Matthew 24. Then will appear in heaven the sign of the Son of Man, then all the tribes of the earth will mourn. And they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. So what Jesus spoke to his disciples, John relays to the church in his final letter. All people will see him. All will acknowledge that Jesus reigns whether they've turned to him or not. 
Have you turned to him? Do you look forward to this? Do you anticipate this arrival with the clouds? The believer says, amen. God's people, secure in Christ, say, Lord, may it be so. The anticipation of, of Christ's coming, that, that was before John in the early church. That's something that should be before us always. This is central to our worship as Christians. We cry out, come Lord Jesus, because that's our heart's desire. To see our Savior, to know the joy at His right hand forevermore. That's our desire. And so this hope of, of Christ's coming really shores up our hearts, gives us security, times of trial, temptation, disaster that threatens to overwhelm us. It's the love of God in Christ, the certainty of His coming, that's the overwhelming comfort. So what is we're going to face the rest of this day, what we'll face going into this week? See, you and I, are, we're, we're very easily distracted. Um, distracted by the things of this world that lure us away, pull for our attention. We, we're inclined to self-absorption. You know, here's what I need Here's what's going on with me. Here's why I hurt. God knows these things. He cares about these things. And I don't know every situation and circumstance each of you are facing, but in general, we're far too big of a deal for ourselves or to ourselves. Let him who loves us and has freed us lift our eyes. Let his coming just shift the focus and the inclinations Our lives are, I mean, a breath. Jesus is the big deal of our lives. And Jesus is going to be exalted forever by his people. The resurrection of Jesus guarantees our resurrection. What God has done by the Spirit in Jesus, he will do by the the Holy Spirit that indwells his people. So we share in the death and resurrection of Christ, and we share in his glory. And that's, that's something that's pictured here at the table. We feast together. We're, you know, we're, it's because that we're united to Christ, united to one another. And so as a church, we certainly want to, to learn more about Jesus, be instructed by Jesus, but even more so, we need more of Jesus, to be nourished by Jesus. And that takes place at this table. Um, and until we see our King coming with the clouds in glory. We're going to feast to remember and to anticipate the meal that's before us. Salvation belongs to our God who sits upon the throne and to the Lamb. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Let's pray. Uh, Father, we do cry out if not so much with our voices in this moment, in our hearts. Come, Lord Jesus. Come with the hosts of heaven. Come with the clouds. That you who have blessed us would receive the eternal doxology of your people. For to you is all glory and dominion forever and ever. Lord, we thank you for this greeting, this blessing that you have given to us through your word this blessing that continues as you feed us at your table. We thank you. Grow us in faith. Keep in our love, our anticipation for the coming of our King. It's in his name that we pray. Amen.